50 years ago, I was sitting in the darkened theater in Ionia, Michigan, and Randy Chirpus flipped on the projector, and in that darkened theater, all by myself, I witnessed the Ten Commandments by Cecil B. DeMille. At the end of that movie, I knew that this was real, and somehow, some way, I had to get to Mount Sinai. It was 20 years later, no, it was 30 years later, that a pastor came to me and said, they found Pharaoh's chariots and army strewn for a mile and a half on the bottom of the Red Sea, and we've got it on video. What I saw was, I was skeptical, but yet I knew that this was real, and then it was about 20 years after that that not only did I meet Ron Wyatt, but he introduced me to some video from Mount Sinai that he said he could give it to me, but he couldn't tell me where it came from because the people's lives were in danger. Well, a number of years later, Jim and Penny Caldwell introduced themselves to me at the end of a seminar that I did and asked me where I got that video. And I said, uh, the man that gave it to me, Ron Wyatt, uh, said that he would give it to me, but I could not know who the people were because their lives were in danger. The gentleman said, that's the right answer because we're the people. And we want you over to our house tomorrow for the Sabbath because everything that we've got is yours to help get this message out. Ladies and gentlemen, I was a skeptic at first, but then as the evidence came out, then I became convinced that the mountain of God had been found in Northwest Saudi Arabia in the ancient land of Midian. But the adventure doesn't stop there. I received a call just a couple of months ago from a gentleman who asked if I could get him or give him the directions to Mount Sinai. Having not been there myself, I got him in touch with Jim and Penny Caldwell. And now, ladies and gentlemen, this is the breaking news, more evidence from Mount Sinai that was never seen by Ron Wyatt, never seen by Jim and Penny Caldwell, has now come out in high resolution. Ladies and gentlemen, the man that has just returned from Saudi Arabia, Joel Richardson. Joel, it is so good to have you back with us. And uh, you were with us uh, for, for, for Passover, and then this adventure has happened, transpired after Passover this year. I can't wait. Please tell us. The, uh, the, the man who was also uh, somewhat skeptical of this, uh, and you decided you were not going to just uh, stand back and listen to the critics. You were going to investigate yourself. And so tell us the story. Yeah, it's been a it's been an amazing uh, year of spiritual warfare and adventure, and um, this has been one of the I would say the highlights of my life. Um, I, it was uh, at the end of last year, actually. A friend of mine who's a part of a ministry that I'm involved with, he said, "Hey, I've got some friends that live in Saudi Arabia, and check out some of these pictures." So he sent me some pictures and I said, oh yeah, yeah, the, the, the real Mount Sinai there in Northwest Saudi Arabia. I said, you know, I've, I've seen some videos over the years, it looks interesting. Um, I'm not so sure because I'd read some criticisms of it and you know, I'm, as a teacher, I'm cautious, right? I don't wanna mm -hmm. just jump on board some idea if it's not substantiated. But I had prayed, and this is what's interesting, is when I had seen some of these videos, I remember specifically, and I like to pray big prayers, by the way, and I, I encourage other people to do that. If the, if the inspiration hits you, I'd seen these videos, and I go, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not sure about this, but God, if you can give me the opportunity, I wanna go see that. I wanna get there, I, I wanna get into Saudi Arabia. And you know, in archeology, span by the way, is not typically my thing. You know, I'm a missions guy, I teach on end time prophecy and this sort of thing, but this is biblical, right? So this is important, I mean, this is, this is the foundation of the story. Absolutely. So I, uh, I text back my friend, I said, hey, just curiously, what's the chance that your friend can um, get me an invitation? In order to get into Saudi Arabia, you need a letter of invitation. I'm not gonna sneak across the borders. Um, I've got five kids, I don't wanna end up in a Saudi prison. Um, and he got right back, right back. He said, absolutely, he can, he can get you in, let's do it. And the moment I got that, I could feel the spiritual warfare. I don't know how to describe, and I'm not a super sensitive guy when it comes to spiritual warfare. I mean, I tend to, I tend to sort of be the bulldog you know, that, that walks through the invisible fence, his, his neck's getting shocked and he just kinda Yeah, yeah. He's not even, he doesn't even feel it. My wife, you know, she's sensitive spiritually. I mean, that moment, I could feel the heaviness and the resistance. And I won't get into all the details, all of the spiritual warfare that my friends who were going there with me, who live in the country, 
all the stuff that they went through, all of the stuff that I went through, but I would say when I see that level of spiritual warfare, I know that it's real, okay? It, it doesn't take a tremendous amount of discernment to recognize that this is a real deal. So I was blessed, I mean. Yeah, that, now there, were, there was death, there were accidents that happened, uh, uh, you know, people were, were injured. Uh, it just to keep this thing from happening, this was what was surrounding you at this time. Yeah, it was high level. I mean, it was level 10 spiritual warfare. We'll put it that way. Mm -hmm. Again, it's some personal stuff with people's family, so we won't get into it, but it was yeah. level 10 spiritual warfare. And so um, it, we kept having delays again, as things, you know, and we kept praying and pushing through, but I knew, I knew that this was the moment. I knew this was the moment in history. And, you know, I wanna be clear, um, you know, Ron Wyatt, the Caldwells, um, you know, there's a, there are a lot of folks who went before and they've invested a lot of years in this, but not just going, they've been praying, I and mean, we're talking 30 years now. Right, right. And they've been laboring in the spirit, saying, Lord, we know this is the real deal. We know this is the real Mount Sinai here in Saudi Arabia. Could you, one, preserve it so that other believers down the road can go there and see and experience the awe that we've experienced? And also, can you somehow do a miracle, geopolitical miracle, so that the doors of Saudi Arabia can be opened? You know, that's right. the, those two things. It has to be preserved and it has to be opened. And I believe that we are finally at that moment in history when that's about to happen. I believe that in the next several years we are going to see Saudi Arabia and specifically Mount Sinai, the real Mount Sinai, is going to become one of the hottest spiritual tourist destinations in the world and it's gonna be one of the biggest archeological news stories in the world because this is, again, this is the foundation. These are the big miracles of the Bible. I mean, Jesus did amazing miracles, but this is split the ocean in half level stuff. I mean, we're talking God's presence manifest in fire on the mountain, and I think in God's sovereignty, he's preserved it. He's hidden this thing. He's distracted everybody with this false tradition, this false idea of Mount mm -hmm. Sinai over in the Sinai Peninsula. And then all the naysayers out there who, who want to say that the Bible isn't true. You know, we, we go right to the Israeli uh, Department of Antiquities. Josias uh, refused to look at the evidence that, that you've seen that you're going to be presenting now because he said no one will ever find Mount Sinai because it's a literary invention. It's just all made up story. That's the official position of the Israeli Department of Antiquities. So when you have the, you know, the so-called uh, archaeologists of Israel who are saying that kind of thing, this, this is the kind of, of opposition that we've been running into uh, for all these years, decades, literally, where Caldwells have been bringing, you know, literally thousands of artifacts and, and all the evidence out to the world and it's all being poo-pooed by those who have never done what you've done, actually have risked your life to get in there and, and also risking the lives of the other people who are there with you. Right, right. Yeah, and this is the thing, and look, and I understand. I understand, I wanna be sympathetic. If you invest hundreds of thousands of dollars to get your PhD and you invest half of your life to become an expert and then just, Joel Richardson or you know Ron Wyatt or the Caldwell, some, somebody just working in the country goes there and gets all these pictures and discovers probably the most significant biblical site in history. I understand there's gonna be jealousy. <laughs> right, and, and you know my experience, if your denomination doesn't find it, then it has no relevance because you know all truth is invested in our denomination, whatever that particular denomination is. But you know, you've got oil field engineers, you know, they, they are not professionals in this particular area, and they're bringing all this evidence to light in the world. Right, and so, you know, just for clarity, again, I'm a skeptic, I'm cautious, but I don't come out and endorse something unless I have worked through the material, and I can say with absolute confidence that the biblical evidence, that the geographical evidence, that the historical traditional evidence, and on top of it, and this is just the cream on top of it all, is the archeological evidence. All of these things absolutely validate that Jabal Allahs, this is the mountain there in Saudi Arabia, just outside of the town of Al-Bad, that that is indeed the real Mount Sinai. And they try to, they try to 
put up sort of this, this scholarly, I'll call it a diversionary smokescreen. They try to make it all about Ron Wyatt, all about the Caldwells. They go, well, these guys aren't legitimate archaeologists, and they try to poke holes in their personal life and attack them personally and make it, they use terms, uh, and I'm not picking on him because, again, I, res I do respect scholars. I respect scholarship. James K. Hoffmeyer is one of the world's leading authorities on the archaeo. He's an Egyptologist. He's a leading authority on this whole subject. And he refers to folks like Wyatt and the Caldwells as, um, he calls this idea that Mount Sinai is in Saudi Arabia, he calls it the fanciful theories of these dilettantes. In other words, you know, it's just sort of this, schol this is scholarly bullying. This is right. derogatory yeah. mocking. And they try to make it all about these people that have looked at it from the 1980s, but what they do, and this is proof that he knows that this is the real deal, is he does not discuss these ancient Christian traditions, these ancient Jewish traditions that go back well over 2,000 years. They go back a couple hundred years before Jesus. This is the most traditionally substantiated site candidate of mm -hmm. any of the Sinai uh, candidates out there. All right, all right. So the, the best you can do is just say that it's a literary invention and we are not going to look at the evidence. But uh, you looked at the evidence and, and you know, I have to say that you know, uh, Jim and Penny, have, as you have said, they have been praying about this, they've been laboring, and when we got together with them, uh, we, we, uh, we, we sat at the table together and said, you know, we have been trying for the last 20 years to get this information out to the world, and between the two of us, there were 13 heart bypasses uh, the, between Jim and I, I said, you know, we thought we would be able to do this when we're young. <laughs> but, but here we are, we're still alive and we're still getting it out. And now someone younger is able to get in there and to, and to do this. And you have found some amazing things that we're, we're gonna show everyone, are we not? We're gonna get into it. Okay, hey, um, now this, uh, th th this location, uh, t tell us a little bit about this location and, and how your skepticism and how you approach this as far as uh, research and, and background on it. Yeah, so I mean, when I, when I first heard about all of this, again, I started reading all of the critical stuff because this is how I always do it. I wanna understand the reasons not to believe it first. And I want I am just as skeptical of articles that are skeptical as I am of the actual site. So I wanna be skeptical of the site, but I'm also cautious with regard. If I see somebody putting up, you know, they're flailing and they're fighting to say this is not it, I'm gonna be skeptical of that as well. Oh, right? yeah. Me yeah. thinks thou dost Yeah, you, you find out what their agenda is and where right. they're coming from, and you research that back. Yeah, that's the only honest way to do it. Right, so I started, I mean, and I work, and there's a lot. If you just type in Jubal Laws, you're gonna get a whole bunch of articles where people have worked very hard. But see, th there's a principle here is I go, why is it that this mountain is the primary mountain that everyone attacks and mocks and goes after? Why? You know, it's kind of like this. It's, it's not like, Constantine's mommy's Mount Sinai. They don't attack that. It, the principle, though, is like this. I always say to Christians, they say, God's done with Israel. I say, if God's done with Israel, then it seems pretty apparent to anyone with a lick of discernment that Satan has not received the memo, right? <laughs> and so it's the same thing. I go, why is there so much demonic, why is there such a concerted effort to debunk this spot and not this other one or this other one? Why is this where all the skepticism is driven? So I see in that, I see a, a legitimate spiritual resistance. Mm -hmm. That's discernment. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, I mean, I worked through all the stuff, and again, you know, probably the most um, vocal of all of the critics is a guy named Gordon Franz. Um, uh, he's written numerous articles trying to debunk. He calls it debunking Jebel Allahs. Again, James K. Hoffmeyer, um, you know, leading world's leading scholar, Egyptologist, archaeologist. In the back of his book, Israel, uh, ancient Israel in the Sinai. Um, he tries to debunk it. Again, David Roll, you've debated David Roll. Mm -hmm. uh, gentleman, um, he has some fantastic information. Um, but again, he also in his book, Exodus, uh, Myth or Fact, he takes a section in the back of his book to try to debunk it. 
And right, and, but that was before uh, I, I took him down to see Jim and Penny, and we literally went through the artifacts and all. And he's he's had a, a shift of heart uh, in this thing since that book came out because he saw the evidence, and that makes all the difference. Seeing the evidence, not uh, not being able to dismiss it, not be able to uh, do a scholarly report on why uh, why it can't be, but seeing the evidence. Right. That's what what changed him. Now you've uh, offered to debate. Uh, you've called uh, all these individuals out uh, for debate on this, have you not? Yeah, and again, because I don't, you know, if I'm going to debate someone, I want to debate the, the world's leading experts on it. And so I invited James K. Hoffmeyer, invited Gordon Franz, I invited David Roll, and one after the other, they all came up with various reasons um, why they wouldn't debate it. Hoffmeyer said, "Well, I don't think the location of Mount Sinai is really that important." I said, "Well, then why'd you write a couple books on the topic?" <laughs> you know, I mean, if it's not important, why'd you? <laughs> right? <laughs> and so, and but why do I want to debate? Not because I could care less about a debate. Because the moment is ripe in history. S the Saudis are about to build a massive city up in this part of Saudi Arabia, and they are about to open up the country. Crown Prince, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman will be the king of Saudi Arabia soon. And the bottom line is, the Saudis are aware that this is the real Mount Sinai. The Saudis are aware that this is the real deal, and they are diversifying their country, so they are moving in the direction of, um, of wanting to have other sources of revenue other than just oil, other than just um, the Islamic uh, tourism to Mecca. They know that tens and hundreds of thousands of Christians and people all over the world, including Muslims, because this is important to all people uh, of all Abrahamic faiths, you know, mm -hmm. of all the monotheistic world religions, Mount Sinai is important. It's, it's actually in the Quran, the stories about Moses and Jethro, that's actually in the Quran. Um, and so they know that this is a, a source of revenue, but it's also a, an important historical site that they're in possession of. And so the moment is ripe. This thing is about to open. And in this, behind all of it, behind what's happening with the Saudi government and so forth, the Lord himself, and this is the point, God himself is about to testify to the world. In, in, in an age of increasing atheism and skepticism where everyone's fallen into unbelief, the Lord is about to testify to the Jewish world. He's gonna say, hey guys, remember the covenant at Sinai? That was real. Remember the split sea? That was real. Remember when I came down in fire? That was real. To the Christian world, he's gonna say, get done with all of your liberalism and your backsliding. The story is real. He's gonna testify to the Arab world, to the Muslim world, and to the unbelievers. And he's about to say, he's about to rip this thing wide open and unveil it. After all this time, the Lord is about to put the spotlight back on the original foundation of the whole story. Well, I can't wait to have this whole story told. And uh, uh, as it says in Revelation, uh, in Revelation 1, 5, there's a reference that takes us all the way back to Mount Sinai. And that, and without Mount Sinai, that reference and revelation, the culmination of the first four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they have no ground, they have no background whatsoever without that being a reality. And once it is a reality, and once that comes out, then the four Gospels are gonna make sense. And then the very thing that, that Yeshua has made us priests and kings will finally be understood. It'll be understood by the Christian world if we can get back to the foundation which is what happened at Mount Sinai. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna have Joel take us to Mount Sinai and sh uh, show the very reality of these things. The story of Mount Sinai may go back just 50 years from me, but it goes back 4,000 years. And what the evidence is, and what's coming out now, there are so many tentacles, there are so many things that come into play. Joel Richardson, just returning from Saudi Arabia. Uh, Joel, tell us about what's going on in Saudi Arabia. Why is this so significant, and, and the, uh, the exposure of this in this day and time? Yeah, it's absolutely amazing what's happening in Saudi Arabia. Um, you know, it's been a closed kingdom. It's been a closed nation for so long. Uh, unless you have a visa to work in the country, you can't get in. So tourism, it's not open to tourism. And all of a sudden, this young reformer named Mohammed, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, he's the son of the present king, uh, he steps onto the world scene and he makes a big splash. He arrests, overnight, he arrests dozens of some of the leading and most wealthy princes in the kingdom. 
um, you know, and he actually had them arrested. And in a lot of ways, it was this was part of his process of reform because he knew he's going to be king uh, mm -hmm. pretty soon, and he wanted to sort of shake down some of the corruption in the country. And all of a sudden, the world's attention is on Saudi Arabia. Wait a minute, we thought this is the most sort of you know closed, radical, um, devout Islamist uh, nation in the world. And all of a sudden, you've got this reformer that's he's letting women drive, he's opening movie theaters, and he's going to open doors to tourism. And all of we go, what in the world's going on? He comes over here to the United States, he does a big tour, he meets with the president, he meets with all of the big heads of all the big tech companies. And one of the big projects that he's about to launch is he's going to build a city called Neom. Neom, N-E-O-M, is slated to become a city. It's not just a city. He calls it a city-state. Uh, there's a video you can go on YouTube. The, the Saudi government has put out a, a video that sort of gives an overview of this. And they talk about it not just as a city or a city-state, but as a new way of living, that mm -hmm. this is going to be the turning point for the future of mankind. This is going to be the most technologically advanced, um, you know, uh, high-tech, green, and global city in the world. So just think Dubai on steroids. Right, now Dubai was really their first foray from a, being an oil uh, empire and all the revenue from that to uh, attempt to go into the, like the shopping mecca of the world, and w which it really is. But this is going to be their foray into the high tech mecca of the world. Yeah, they want it to be a business center where people from all over Europe, all over Asia, South America, like people from all over the world will come here to do business. This is going to become a business hub. Listen to this. They're saying it's going to be 33 times larger than New York City. Wait. 33 times larger than New York City? That's the plan, is it? This is a parcel of land that they plotted out, which is like 200 square miles, is it not? Yeah, this is huge. So I'll show you a picture. Um, there's maps, of course. Here's a picture, by the way, of Mohammed bin Salman. Again, he's only, he's only 31, 32 years old. Um, he, this is a face that mm -hmm. he is going to become a, a very common uh, world leader. I mean, he is changing the world. But so here's a picture of Saudi Arabia. So up here in the northwest corner, this little circle that says Neom, that's the entire region. This is called the Tobuk province. And they're already, by the way, this is not just something they're going to do, they are already starting it. When we were up there, we were running into engineers, European engineers, they are already in the process of laying the groundwork. They're, the airport is being put in place, the king can fly in. Um, they're already beginning plans to build all of these resorts along the Red Sea as sort of a launching pad for all of the workers. They can stay at the resorts. One of the hotels that we stayed at was having a NEOM conference. I mean, when we walked in, big sign, welcome, mm -hmm. NEOM, the future, and all of this. And so look at another map. This is a zoomed in area. And again, to the left here is the Sinai Peninsula. This is the Egyptian Sinai. So in the mm -hmm. southern center of that is where the traditional uh, traditionalists believe that Mount Sinai is located. Over here to the right, you can see the white line. That's where Neom will be. And in the middle, I've put this uh, blue triangle. That's where Mount Sinai is. That's where the real Mount Sinai right is. Right square in the middle of what is, they are planning for the high-tech mecca of planet Earth, right there. Yep. And, and of course, this is they're gonna be inviting hundreds of thousands of people. So of course it's going to become open to the world. Of course it's gonna be open to the world. And so this is what Jim and Penny have been saying is that uh, by them uh, keeping Mount Sinai uh, behind uh, a chain link fence with, with, uh, with guards, with, uh, with, with Bedouin guards, armed guards there, it really has preserved this from being taken over or being polluted. And now they know what's there, there's no question. Yep. Tell, tell, tell us how, because you're the one that sent me the video of Shabbat Night Live on, uh, on Arab television. Uh, t tell us about what, what they now know and what's uh, you know, the background on that. Yeah, and so, I mean, the Saudi royal family, the Saudi government, just like any other country, it's a country with uh, all sorts of conflicting political interests and so forth. But in fairness to the Saudis, they have done a very good job. Um, they put up a fence way back when Ron Wyatt was visiting and he made them aware of that. The fences went up and people say, well, this is because they were trying to hide the reality. They don't want the world to know that Mount Sinai is here. But in truth, 
I think they said we should just preserve and protect it just in case. And they've done a very good job of stewarding this location. And again, and, and they have, they've done archaeology on it. They, they've done digs in, in proving certain things on that. You're going to be sharing, right? Yeah, the Saudis themselves have, have done some initial investigations, mm -hmm. some preliminary. And they, in my opinion, some of the things, because um, maybe they did have a bit of an agenda. They didn't want um, these people sneaking into the country and visiting it. There was, there was some of that for sure. Um, but some of the findings they had indeed validated these mm -hmm. various archeological sites around the mountain. Um, but so here we are at this moment in history, this moment right in history where it's about to become open. Um, I have talked to um, some Saudi royals and all of the information that I have is that they believe it's the Mount Sinai. They have various scholars that believe it's the Mount, real Mount Sinai. They have artifacts that they are going to bring out to the world and present to the world that validate the fact that this is the Mount Sinai. And they recognize that what they have, and they're, they're actually, in my opinion, doing a very good job. Now, I said there's some conflicting political interests. Yeah, there's some uh, contingents, no doubt, no doubt within the country that uh, don't want Westerners coming in, that don't want uh, non-Muslims coming in and so forth. And so they have to deal with that. They have to deal with, you know, just like any, any government has to deal with. But there is this contingent right now that's running the government, that will be running the country, that does have a genuine heart to open the country up for moderation, to open it up to the world. And so, like I said, this is about to become, I think, the biggest spiritual pilgrim destination. Like, I've been to Israel many, many times. I love it. It's a powerful experience. Nothing in my life has been as soul-stirring, as faith-building, as visiting this site. Again, I was just, I was in awe. You can feel, and I don't mean to get spooky, but you can feel the echoes of what happened there 3,500, 4,000 years ago. You can feel the, you can feel the presence of God. That's the only way I know how to describe yeah, it. Yeah. And I want others, I know Jim and Penny, I know every, anyone else that's been there, they have a heart, they want to see others experience that as well. And in the years ahead, I think, People from all over the world are gonna, they'll have the opportunity to experience that. Well, Tim Mahoney in his uh, film, Patterns of Evidence, uh, he, he did an excellent job uh, laying out the, the history and the archeology span and, and with David Roll, uh, uh, showing Israel's exodus uh, and, and getting them to the Yom Suf, to, to the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. But that's where the movie ends because he tried to get in with Jim and Penny, with Aaron Sen, with others, and get in uh, to Saudi Arabia, and every bit of their evidence, their, their, their cameras, everything was confiscated from them, but, but things look like they're breaking, and this may be, um, I, I'm hoping that the next, uh, uh, the next edition of Patterns of Evidence taking us all the way to Mount Sinai, and you've, you've got some information that uh, the Saudis may want to get involved with exposing this to the world. Yeah, no, absolutely. So Muhammad, um, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, he's gonna be the king. Um, his brother is um, Mohammed bin Sultan. He's the Minister of Heritage and Tourism, or Tourism and Heritage, and um, everything that I hear is that he is fascinated, very interested in this location. And so, um, you know, in a, in a very unique and interesting way, I think at this moment we have shared common interests. The mm -hmm. Christian world and the leaders of the kingdom, the, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia have shared interests. They want to see tourism come in. They want to see interest come in. They, this is gonna be a financial, uh, this is gonna be fantastic for them. Yeah. But for Christians in particular, again, as I said, people, all peoples, um, who are children of Abraham, including Muslims, are going to want to visit. When we were there, we ran into a group of um, Pakistanis. They work in the country. They work there in Saudi Arabia. We started talking real friendly, and um, they had heard about Mount Sinai. They said, oh, yeah, we heard that this is the mountain of Moses. We want to go see it. And we said, well, we're going. You want to come with us? And they, This is Pakistanis. Yeah, Muslims. Who, yeah. And uh, we had a great time. They spent the day with us, and we, we uh, actually went to the Split Rock, we're gonna talk about that later in another show. Um, but so the point is this, is this is a place of fascination for Muslims, for Christians, for Jews. Yeah, across now, the now for those who, who may not be aware, you know, when he uh, speaks of the split rock, this is a split rock at Rephidim, the, the rock that Moses struck that out of it, 
belched the rivers of water that came down to the camp of Israel, and we're going to be uh, we're going to be taking people there. You were right there at that spot, and and taking Muslim Pakistanis there with you who had heard about that and wanted to, wanted to see it. Yeah, and they were absolutely fascinated. And here's the thing too, and I'll point this out, is that they had heard about this not from Ron Wyatt, not from Jim and Penny Caldwell, from the locals. The locals call it the split rock of Moses. Well, I'll show you some video later. The locals refer to Jabal Allah as the mountain that we believe is Mount Sinai. You know what they call it? They call it Jabal Musa, the mountain Jebel of Moses. Musa. Yeah. So again, and, and as we'll see again, we'll talk about this later, there are ancient Jewish and Christian traditions that go all the way back 250 years before Jesus, that go back to the time of Jesus that they believe that this is the real Mount Sinai. This mountain just outside of the town of Albad, which they believe was Midian, they believe this is the real mountain. So this has more traditional historical evidence than any other candidate out there. And so therefore, as we'll see, the locals, the local Muslims have always believed this. And so they haven't come under the sway. The, the, I'm, I'm referring to the skeptics. The skeptics try to say, well, you know, all you, you Christians and you, know, you Messianic Jews, you've been duped by Ron Wyatt, right? <laughs> you, by the fanciful theories of these dilettantes. But I go, no, Josephus and Philo back in the first century were not deceived by Ron Wyatt. The local Muslims were not deceived by Ron Wyatt. They have always believed that this is the real Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. So we need to understand Bedouin local tradition, the Saudi archeological authorities, they have all these sites fenced off and designated, you can look it up. They refer to the caves of Jethro. They refer to the well of Moses right there in the town of Albad. They call the mountain the mountain of Moses. They call the split rock the split rock of Moses. So this is, this has been behind closed doors. Again, the skeptics want to say, oh, this is just some idea that some you know, modern American evangelicals have come up with and it's sensationalism. That's nonsense. That narrative is nonsense. Yeah. And we, we can go back to the origin of Helena's Mount Sinai, and we can see all the traditions that are surrounded that, and none of, none of that really makes sense. You know, this is uh, where David and Roll and I debated this, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the great Exodus debate, in which, uh, you know, the, the sites that they have marked out, the traditional sites of Mara, the, the place of bitter waters, and uh, uh, the uh, 70 palms and the 12 wells, they're all all in the wrong place. They're, they're all in the wrong course of events, even though they built monuments, Catholic, uh, or you know, I guess Catholic monuments there uh, to commemorate these things, but they're in the wrong order of events. It's only when you cross uh, there at, uh, at, at Nueva, it's only there that you have everything in the right order, and you've got video, you've got uh, photographs to show us the, some of these different things, do you not? Yeah, I've got all kinds, of, all kinds of photographs. I'll show you real quick. You know, so here's the mount. Here's Mount Sinai. This is, it's called Jabal al-Laws, Jabal al-Makla, the dark tip right mm -hmm. there. You've probably seen some of these on the internet. Um, it is a rugged, rugged mountain. And you know, it's, what's interesting is Josephus in the first century he actually refers to the mountain as an exceedingly rugged mountain, really difficult to climb. And so, you know, when I'm there, if you've been there, you go, yeah, it's an exceedingly rugged mountain. I mean, it takes, depending on which side you go up, it can take you all day to get up there. Mm -hmm. And um, and so now th this is something when we came to the mountain and it was on the first day of the third month as a Rosh Kodesh of the new month uh, of the third month and Moses went up into the mountain. So you've actually uh, tread that, that same area. So he was going up in sandals. You probably had a little more sophisticated footwear, but um, you, you say it could take an entire day to get up that mountain. Yeah, and that's, I mean, in the Saudi heat, right? you know, this is not just like hiking up a trail. There's no trails. You're climbing over rocks. You can't even go up with hiking poles. You know, you're climbing and clawing. And the whole thing, by the way, here's just some pictures of the local, uh, you know, everything is bristly. It's desert. You walk yeah. through, there's sharp, harsh thorns everywhere. It would have been tough on Moses if he had sandals. You know, his feet would have got chewed up. I had hiking boots on, and I still, my ankles got all chewed up. I had thorns for months afterwards still in my fingers because I didn't have gloves. It's a, it's a tough desert mountain. 
And so hopefully in the days ahead, but I'm hoping that the Saudis will actually create a nice hiking trail so that as tours go, we can walk up to the top a little bit easier. But for mm -hmm. right now, it's a, it's a beast of a mountain. It's about 8,000 square feet. Uh, 8,000 feet tall. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I was uh, very excited because of the first thing I saw, uh, I knew that you were going in, of course, but when I saw you in, in the video, in the cave of Elijah on top of the mountain, it's like, what a, what a dream come true that you actually got to go there. This is, this is incredible. Yeah, like I said, it's, and, and again, it's one thing, you know, to see it on, uh, on the internet. It's one thing to see pictures, but when you're there, you see the, the, the topography, you see the layout, you read the scriptures over and over and over again on every point, everything falls into place. This is what's amazing. The skeptics pick away. They go, well, this, they try to sow doubt here. This, they try to sow, well, this is a coincidence. This is a coincidence. At some point, when you've got a dozen coincidences, you have to be a fool. You have to be a fool. Yeah, and they, they're all substantiated by the scripture. Yeah. And that, that, that's really, uh, you know, my experience with Wyatt is that he actually went by the scripture and went to these places where the scripture said. And it was James Irwin, the, the, the moon astronaut, uh, that, that could see Mount Sinai. They could see the, the split rock. They could see that from a satellite in space. And, and so yeah. these were the kind of things that, that, that really compelled him to go with his two sons and cross a desert in the middle of the night after years of trying to get uh, authorization. And he risked his life and really risked his son's lives, they ended up 73 days in a Saudi Arabian prison uh, yeah, because of that. You gotta give the guy credit. I mean, look, he's received a lot of criticism. I've never met him, I never have not met his sons. But you gotta give the guy credit. If you're willing to sit for three months in a Saudi prison, you got some street cred, right? You got, you've got some, you've got, I mean, he was, he believed. He believed and he was willing to risk it. And by the way, after being in Saudi prison for 70 some odd days, he turns around and less than a year later, he came back. He came back and did it again. And so he didn't do it, he did it for one reason. He believed this was the real deal. That's right, and, and that was what, uh, when the Saudi prince came out and they flew him out to that site and he showed him the altar of the golden calf, that's when they decided this is the real thing. Because, you know, this, this is not part of Egyptian, I mean, Arabian culture at all. Uh, Apis and Hathor, the Egyptian cow and bull gods, they recognized this as Egyptian and that is what freed him after 76 days uh, in, in prison on this. Uh, uh, Joel, we, we, we gotta have you back. Uh, we're, we're gonna uh, really explore this thing now because you're gonna show us some evidence, some, some etchings on the rock that, that no one has seen before, and we're gonna be back. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the treat of a lifetime. Get your friends, your neighbors, your enemies, get everyone back here next week for Shabbat Night Live because we are taking you to Mount Sinai. <laughs> 